When you see in this industry, there are a lot of people who will grind themselves into a divorce because... So the big question is, what are top agents doing to absolutely crush it in real estate, grow their teams and add more transactions year over year while so many struggle? To get the answers, we interview the top real estate agents to learn their secrets to success. My name is Andrew Dunn. And my name is Peter Michael. Welcome to Lead Agent Secrets. I know what, one of the things about, I guess, topic one, I wanted to kind of roll into topic two. Hopefully they don't cross over too much, but they obviously do, which is about having a support, supportive, your second topic is about having a supportive partner and team. So I want to unpack whether that is your second secret to your success. Yes. From, from the get-go, my wife has been outstanding, right? When, uh, as most agents know out there, real estate is a 24-hour job evenings, weekends, nights. And as you were building, as we were building what we were building, I couldn't have done it without her. Right. I mean, if, if she wasn't on the same page as me to, in what we were building, it just, the world would collapse around me. Right. I mean, she is incredible. And I think that is the secret weapon in people who have marriage i mean obviously if you're single and you you're real estate you don't have any relationship like it right there <laughs> like, where you, you, you can do whatever you want to and uh but in order to you just have to have that uh that support and somebody who is there and i mean there's in real estate you you win a lot of them and you lose a lot of them right i mean we i wish we I could say i get every listing every buyer every offer i write but you come home sometimes and are just demoralized and then you have a somebody who tells you how great you are and then sends you back out the door to do it again. So uh, having a supporting uh, partner is, is really valuable. What do us lonely folks do? It's a real question, Spencer. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. What do, what, do us, what do us lonely ones who just got a love for race cars do? <laughs> just, just keep working. Just keep working. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's interesting that this is one of your topics, Spencer, because my wife has always been supportive, right? As entrepreneurs, yeah. when we first start out, that is a commitment where if you don't have a supportive partner, they simply just will not understand what mm -hmm. is required and why you're doing what you're doing. And the very least, the last thing you want to do is you have to explain yourself when you get home or when you're at home. Right. It is. You've just gotten punched in the face 15 million <laughs> times throughout your day. And you, you are hoping to just come home, close the door and not get punched in the face. And you get punched in the face. Right. Right. And when I, when I look at, at it, so it's, it's not only that moral support, but to be on that same page, like, I mean, my wife and I go through our, our, you know, our budget and look at the numbers of the business every single month, right? We, we have to be on that same page. If we aren't building towards the same ultimate goal, the same retirement, the same dreams, um, if, if we're going out there and it, it just, it doesn't, doesn't fall into the line. So it's hard to have a marriage. It's, it's even probably harder to be married to a realtor, um, but it is a, you know, and you see it in this industry, there are a lot of people who will grind themselves into a divorce because yeah, we'll have clients out there uh, or, or friends who say, oh man, it must be so nice to be a realtor. You have all the freedom you, you, you need. And I always say, I have all the freedom to work 24 hours a day if I want to. Like that's the freedom that we have in real estate, right? Yeah. And that's uh, just one of those things where if we are on the same page, I mean, it, it doesn't work. One of the things I think this is we're really touching on here, which I want to kind of unpack is having a supportive partner is one thing. I think this also really what we're talking about is also setting boundaries, right? And hand communication, both with spouse and client. That's the other thing that this kind of coincides with, because if there's not boundaries set, if there isn't expectations set on both sides from, hey, this is what I can expect from me, you, you from you being your wife, and then you from you being your client, then everything will implode because no one's got any rules that they're playing by now. And now it's like just basically a clusterfuck, right? Like what is going Absolutely. on? So well, you how do you do that? How have you overcame that? Well, and it's interesting because it's always always changing, right? Um, when I was a solo agent, I had to start steering clients to day showings or like, you know, you're doing everything and you're on showings all the time. You're like, I just can't be working every single night, every single weekend. So you start steering clients and setting expectations. This is when we can do it. Well, then we then I started a team and then I have people, who, uh, some of my teams are showing properties. And then we started saying, we can show whenever you want to. But then it gets out of hand again because then... 
it may not be me, but it'll be the rest of the team. And so then it's a, a matter of setting that expectation. But every conversation you have has to lead to those expectations. I mean, we have a introductory buyers meeting all the time and with every single client to make sure that they know what to expect from us. And then we know what to expect from them at the same time. So does that coincide with like a set schedule of like working hours then too? So now you are like, I am available from eight to six and six onwards. I'm not, but six onwards, you could get Mary. I don't know. And like, cause you said you share a number and email and stuff like, yeah. is it just, it, you, everyone gets notified. And then after a certain time, they know you won't respond and they'll get another person. Yeah. We try in on my voicemail. You always have it set up to say when I'm going to call people back. Um, and and people know during the business day they can get a hold of us. In the evening, it you know goes to wherever it goes. So yes, it does does create more of a boundaries. And I say it like I'm an expert, and it's always constantly learning, right? I wish I could say that I I work forty hours also, and I don't work forty hours. I still work more than forty hours. But I it is a ever ever changing, ever evolving, and just making it better. And as the team gets better over the years and more experience, I mean, it really takes two two and a half years to have team member, new team members fully firing, um, you know, and as, as every time they get better, we're getting better. And then we can set those expectations and the times can change. Well, one of, one of the things that I have a kind of, I guess, a follow-up question for you is as you started obviously growing and as you realize that you can only do so much, what was the trigger for you to be like, okay, I don't think I can do this by myself. Was it a number of transactions? Because we have this thing that we are seeing that there's a certain number of either transactions or volume where, where most of us be like, okay, I think it's time for a little bit of help. Right. And and the question is, where is that threshold for people? For mm-hmm. people who are grinders, I mean, I'm, I'm driven. Okay, that's who I am. I'm sure I push that further than... Uh, some people, you know, but all, all top agents push that further than, than some people. But uh, for me, I couldn't get above the 10 million a year ceiling. I mean, I could just reach past it and come in and that's my market to Benny. I mean, you're in California and you sell, sell, sell $2 million houses. Like that is a different story, but kind of that 30 to 40 transactions a year was, yeah. I just couldn't quite, uh, at that it's, point, it's, it's very I, interesting you say 30 to 40 because the number seems to be around 30 for most. And it doesn't matter yeah. what market, doesn't matter what price yeah. point it is. Yeah, it seems to be 30. It's 30 yeah. people get to and they're like, I'm burning out, man. I just can't do it anymore. Yeah. Absolutely. One, I mean, that's, that's a number. Yeah. We had one guy. I'm not even joking. 200 he did as a solo agent. 200 in a year. Uh, okay. But you got to put it in a little bit of context. What? Young. Handsome, yeah. single, yeah. charismatic, <laughs> and all he did was work. He, he's okay. an Italian New Yorker, just like <laughs> crazy hustle. And yeah. we met him, he came on the show, and he was like, dude, and he was like, just for perspective, I had no team. And we're like, well, what do you mean? You had TC and an admin. And he was like, no, literally had no one. I wrote every contract, did everything. Oh. <laughs> oh, and actually. everyone else is going, what? And I'm what? like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> These guys have lost their fucking mind. When we had and this yeah. amazing woman on, Jess, and she did a million in GCI as a solo agent in a year. Uh, and her price point was obviously a little bit higher. She doesn't didn't do as many transactions, but she made a million in, in income in a year. And then she was like, That's That's doing this again. Yeah. I'm getting a team. Yeah. <laughs> I'm <doing> <laughs> And so then you make that first hire, right? And you're you're doing thirty to forty a year, and and you put a stack. I mean, the first day she walked in, the, my first hire. I mean, I had a you know sixty transaction folders on the table, and said, "Go through these, help me out, figure out where these go." I mean, they were all closed transactions. Like I just couldn't even file anything. Like I mean, it just starts stacking up around you. When when it actually you touched on earlier, some we've we've kind of unpacked the partner side, but with the team side, something you mentioned earlier is you're looking at like a, nearly two years for them to be like really dialed in and like firing all yeah. cylinders. I'm guessing ultimate trust, like you know they're just going to do their shit and you can walk away and you can they're just happy. Right? Can you talk a little bit more about? I guess the supportive network or uh, process that you've built from boarding agents, because I know you're paying them just a little bit different, but one of the biggest retention um, issues in real estate is 
due to poor onboarding. So this is something we are heavily invested in is like having great onboarding experiences, right. having roadmaps and figuring out the goals they want to achieve because we want to align ourselves with people like us, right? So people who join our team, we want that alignment, but we also understand that like they don't want exactly what we want. But if it's within the same realm, then the alignment is there. So I want to, I'm interested about your onboarding process and the training process when someone comes into your team and that kind of support. Yeah, and we've gotten better at that. Um, initially, it was here's a f- folder. Is hope you figured out right. And uh, um, it's we have a 12 week training program. Um, we we've recorded a lot of videos of different aspects of what we're doing. We have breakdowns of all the different avenues. Um, it's a it's a it's a good training program. The flaws. Uh, my last two hires were not licensed agents when they came in, so it it takes you to you know. If you had twelve, if you had somebody who actually had a, a real estate license, twelve weeks and in, in kind of understanding how we do things would be would be great. But actually, getting a license and uh, learning everything at one time—I mean, it's a—they uh, were overwhelmed for a while. I <laughs> we just kept on doing, but I mean, it is a. Uh, I mean, the other thing is the cross training, having different team members. It doesn't have to be me who trains everyone, and it's better if it's not me who trains everyone because they know what they're doing better than I do. So when it comes to, I guess, that's an interesting point you bring up, actually, the cross-training and, I guess, training on different processes. Because everyone chips in to different parts of the process, does that not like generate some kind of interesting situations where you've got people who aren't necessarily as experienced trying to help with other stuff because the really experienced person isn't available does that is that what takes so long to train up? That's why it's like a two year period because it's to get everyone a very good knowledge base on every section. Is that the issue? That's that's what I like understanding. I mean, we can get somebody to come in and say, you know, follow a checklist from A to Z, but to come in and understand what every piece of that checklist means and does because. Every question is different, slightly different. I mean, we get the same general questions, but all of a sudden it's like, well, what does this mean in the title? Well, now let's figure out, like, not only do we know we're delivering the title to them or delivering the inspection report, well, what does this actually mean? So my experience is it's kind of that two, two and a half years is where people start really like blossoming and not only doing their job, but helping with everybody else around you. And I think that's, to me, the problem with the pandemic is everybody, when you work remotely, you can do your job, but it's hard to do, to help out, to know what else needs to be done around there. And I think about these companies who do, um, um, who are going full-time remote. And I think it's uh, going to be a struggle uh, to get people to collaborate very much. I I actually hope 100% agree. I mean, <laughs> a little bit of context back in December of, uh, 2020 so what's that a year and a bit ago i had 26 people in my team fully remote <clears throat> so like that's not a small team right no. and there is and i don't want to go down this rabbit hole but i'll just touch on one of the biggest things i saw over growing a remote team and it's something that no one can really tell you unless you experience it but like there is definitely like mental health problems that start happening because people become lonely and they 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 think about the freedom of being able to wake up and do the job and that that freedom, but not having that human interaction is caused a lot of problems. When right. people are in the office, you might not like one dude one day or whatever, but <laughs> there is there is a camaraderie, there is this human connection that we need. It's not we want, we absolutely need it in our lives, which is why you tend to find happiness levels and stuff in general if you're in a good office a good environment people tend to enjoy coming to work they enjoy the experience because it's about the people right as much as it is enjoying enjoying what you do i i think it's um i i think remote companies i think are gonna struggle Uh, is there going to be a solution potentially we don't know it's obviously very early doors but i think uh, for people that have never experienced it from a managerial standpoint, from an ownership, from a business owner perspective, there is a lot more challenges. And that's just one of them. Like there is a lot of communication issues that go on. Uh, you know, it's like 
what you zooming and using slack or messenger or whatever your your project management tools stuff goes awry you're all emailing clients like yeah. there is so much going on there when you're in an office it's like hey jeff did you email susan yeah i did mate cheers <laughs> yeah. absolutely but that's yeah. the conversation like that that's me being real because I've, I've, yeah. I've done it like i've been yeah. on the other end and i'm like yeah. i when we got into the office and there was just a few of us like the managers and the, the c-suite and we sat around a table and we went out for basically like a long weekend and we all worked together and this was um kind of not i'm not gonna say post pandemic but with regards like later on in it it was like in three to four days we were like, we've crushed out more work than we do in weeks working right. alone at home because we were just able to communicate so effectively, just talk to them across it. And it's like, we were all happier. We went out and, you know, this is, I'm going down a bit of a rabbit hole here, but I, I do <laughs> think it's something that I think people don't appreciate. Like they think it's going to be good. It's a bit like sweets and chocolate, right? It's like they taste yeah. great. And then there's this afterburn. <laughs> it's like, it probably wasn't so good for you. Oh, and by the way, if you're listening to this and you aren't making at least $100,000 per year in GCI and you're looking for a predictable system to get you there, then head over to go.eliteagentsecrets.com.